This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a subscription box inspiring girls to believe they can be and do anything. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. Why do you do what you do? <laughs> You're a history professor. Oh, okay. I thought you meant just broadly. Yeah, I know. know like in the to, universe. To narrow the question. <laughs> You're a history professor. Okay. Why are you a history professor? Uh, because I love history. I find it fascinating and enlightening. I love storytelling, which I think gets at the core of what it is to be human. But I think mostly something I love to do is to get a room full of people who couldn't care less about something and try to make them care. I really hmm. enjoy that challenge. <laughs> hmm. That's what you're best at, forcing people to find things interesting <laughs> by your sheer <laughs> interestingness <laughs> you will be captivated by this. you will care you will <laughs> i love the challenge of that give me something immensely dull and i will just <laughs> revel in trying to make it compelling hmm. i teach women's studies and i think the thing that i like the most about it is I, I love teaching literature, but I realized really what I want to do is teach women's studies because it's instant gratification. Mm. When a piece of literature changes a student's life, they don't know for 14 years. Yeah. You look back and go, oh, that was the thing that changed my life. Mm -hmm. But I want to be there and get the credit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to wait 14 years for them to no, say, I don't, good job. No, I don't want the letter 14 years later. I want the, at the end of the classroom. My entire life is changed because of you. <laughs> and that's what women's studies does. Get to blow their minds every day. <laughs> and knowledge and justice and stuff. Well, yeah. So today's story is about two Jewish orphan girls growing up in the same orphanage slash foster care system in New Orleans, decades apart. Whoa. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. So Bessie Margolin was a Jewish girl growing up in Memphis, Tennessee, when her mother died when she was four years old. And she and her two siblings were sent to the most famous Jewish orphanage in the South, which was in New Orleans. Wow. So to learn more about Bessie Margolin, I talked to Marlene Trestman. I'm Marlene Trestman, and I'm the author of Fair Labor Lawyer, The Remarkable Life of New Deal Attorney and Supreme Court Advocate Bessie Margolin. Marlene Trussman is a career attorney. She's a former special assistant to the Maryland Attorney General, and she has taught law at Loyola University. Before there was a notorious RBG, there was an audacious Bessie Margolin. She was part of and contributed to some of the major legal events in our nation's history. She grew up in a Jewish orphanage in New Orleans. She got a scholarship to Newcomb College from her high school. From there, she decided after two years to go to law school, which no girl from the orphanage had ever done. She was among the first women law graduates in the country, among the tops in her law school class and was able to become one of the first women awarded Yale's prestigious Sterling Fellowship, and with that, got the equivalent of a PhD in law. Bessie came into the orphanage much like many of the other children. Her mother had died after giving birth to a third sibling. The family was living in Memphis, Tennessee, and a rabbi in the Memphis area knew about the Jewish orphanage in New Orleans. 
So in 1913, Bessie at age four and her two siblings were admitted to the Jewish Orphans Home in New Orleans. The home at that time sat quite prominently on St. Charles Avenue in New Orleans, which is one of the most beautiful thoroughfares in the United States. It sat among the mansions of the most prosperous citizens of New Orleans and was just two blocks away from the Isidore Newman School, which the orphanage had founded a decade earlier for its children first, but also admitted the children of prosperous New Orleanians, regardless of religion, where the parents of these other children paid tuition. Wow. And it is still an extremely prestigious school. Wow. When I think New Orleans 1920, I just yeah. don't think fancy Jewish yeah. boarding school. <laughs> that is not the first thing that comes right. to mind. And that's interesting to me, too, how much we have erased the story of Jewish people in the South. Hmm. Jewish people are in the Northeast. Right. Yeah. They're in New York City. Right. Yeah. They're in Lola Ridge's Jewish ghetto. Right. And here there is a very large, very established, very wealthy Jewish community in New Orleans. Wow. As soon as I started reading about it, I thought, of course there is. New Orleans is a hugely important port all through the 18th and 19th centuries. Right. Jewish families have been established here for 300 years at this point. Huh. Sort of similar to the Californios in, in our last episode. We think of these as transitory populations when, in fact, they were here well before yeah. most of the other people. So all of the children from the orphanage can attend the Isidore Newman School. This means that you have orphan children studying alongside the wealthiest. Huh. And both of them are being encouraged to aspire to the very highest levels of society. Huh. So Bessie's time in the orphanage was marked by a very pious reform Judaism, which at that time was preaching philanthropy through social justice to begin to understand the root causes for why these children were there. These children were the recipients of great benevolence from the local Jewish community in New Orleans and from the surrounding states that sent children there. Amazing medical care, the food that was served to them, the accommodations, at least it wasn't elaborate, but it was hygienic and clean. And again, attending outside of the orphanage, the Isidore Newman School gave these children the ability to aspire upwardly and to seek out the kinds of futures that their classmates had. To go out into the world, not only to be self-sustaining, but also to show themselves as um, independent, patriotic American Jews, which was particularly important. It was a Montessori style of kindergarten education. College preparatory classes were as predominant as what was available in printmaking or in home economics. So she went to a scholarship to Newcomb College, which is the women's college associated with Tulane. Cool. She grew up in this hyper-competitive co-ed environment, which was very unusual for girls at that point, hmm. to be getting this kind of schooling in a co-ed environment. So she's already used to competing with boys. She's already dealt with all of this, right? So it's not a surprise when she gets to college. Yeah. I think at those earliest stages, she really fine-tuned, I think, her ability to win over and endear herself to others. There's a great story. One of her law school classmates, 50 years later at their reunion, told the story that was fortunately memorialized in some of the reunion materials. He talked about how Bessie, being the only woman in the class, often presented some uncomfortable moments for these men who were in no way used to having this woman be there and be there on, on equal footing. And he said that the law professor began to talk about a case and it had to do with some accident in a men's bathroom. And none of the men in the class wanted to recite the facts of the case. None of them will say the word toilet. 
in mixed company. And so none of them can speak. And finally, apparently, one of the students sort of all in a rush, washroom, and they all laugh and then they can move on. But, but she's breaking all of the norms. No one knows what to do with her wow. in this law school. <laughs> When she decided on her own that she wanted to attend law school, she ended up graduating from Tulane, not only from the law school, but had also gotten enough credits to receive her liberal arts degree from Tulane University itself. So when she graduates from Tulane, she is a complete anomaly. She not only is graduating with her law degree, which is already pretty unheard of, Mm -hmm. but she has also assembled enough credits while she's in school to finish a bachelor's degree as well. And so she graduates with an arts and science degree as she finishes law school from Tulane University. Right on. So when Bessie Margolin finished law school, she worked for the Tennessee Valley Authority for a little while. She did a few other internships and a few other jobs. But pretty quickly, she ended up working at the Labor Department under the first female secretary of labor, and in fact, the first female cabinet secretary ever, and also my personal hero, Frances Perkins. That's awesome. So Bessie Margolin is now in charge of arguing keynote pieces of fair labor standards. She's arguing for minimum wage. She's arguing for the Equal Pay Act, that you may not pay men and women differently for the same job. Wow. When you said she she graduated with her law degree, I was thinking, that's awesome, but who's going to hire a female lawyer at the time? Exactly. (laughs) So I did not expect her to end up working for the federal government. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, the federal government was the most likely place for a woman lawyer to be employed. Mm. For a woman to become a partner in a private law firm at this point is really difficult. There are very few women who are doing that. Wow. She rose in the ranks. Her talents were recognized. She was given the rather prestigious responsibility of being able to argue on behalf of the Labor Department at the Supreme Court and was the 25th woman ever to argue at the Supreme Court when she first argued there in 1945. She would return to the Supreme Court on 24 occasions, which still is a record. She's still only one of six women to argue that many times at the Supreme Court to this day. And she's arguing brand new, really difficult law. Hmm. And as Marlene Trustman says, she was essentially doing it backwards and in heels. Uh (laughs) She had a huge profound impact on American life that that we don't even talk about. You know, FDR gets credit for the New Deal when the more you dig into the history, the clearer it becomes that the New Deal was the work of women. It was the work of Frances Perkins. It was the work of Bessie Margolin. It was a a large group of fiercely dedicated women Mm -hmm. that, that were seeing on the ground as social workers the real harm that was happening to whole communities from the lack of regulation and labor standards and their just absolute determination Hmm. to make sure that human dignity applied no matter what job you were doing. Yeah, I mean, thinking about it, it's one thing to come up with the idea and say, I'm going to do this, the New Deal, but Bessie Margolin was the one who had to defend it in front of the Supreme Court to make it really happen. Exactly in the face of huge amounts of resistance from the most powerful men in the country. Wow. Awesome. And now let's pause for a word from our sponsor. Girls Can Crate is an awesome subscription box that introduces girls age 5 to 10 to real, fearless women who made the world better. Every crate features an inspiring woman, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on STEAM activities and more. So when I first heard about these crates, I thought they seemed really cool, but I have to say when my kids got their first crate, I was genuinely amazed at how awesome it was. It really exceeded my expectations. But today we're also doing something exciting. Our exciting giveaway extravaganza! (laughs) We're giving away a free Girls Can Crate this month to one of our lucky listeners. For details on how to win, go to whatshernamepodcast.com and click on the giveaway link. The contest ends on April 30th, so make sure you enter right away. What's Your Name believes that real women make the best heroes, and every month, Girls Can Crate delivers them. 
Girls Can Crate, C R A T E, dot com and use the code her name to get 20% off. There is one break in her career at the Labor Department, and that is when she was sent to Europe to work on the Nuremberg Trials. What? Yes. The Nuremberg Trials, the famous trials of all of the Nazi party after World War II. Exactly, where we are trying all of the Nazi war criminals, the, yes. And she is a Jewish woman there to try the Nazis. And not just there, she is assigned to draft the rules by which these trials will be conducted. Wow, that is crazy. You know, in contrast to Frances Perkins, who was the head of the labor department at that point, who is clearly deciding that being the school marmish, frumpy mom is the best way for her to succeed in this job to be taken seriously. But Betsy Marglin definitely seems to have decided that using her attractiveness, her ability to dress in a certain way, is giving her power to sort of turn it into a tool in her toolbox. She was attractive. She was the person I've been told throughout her life made heads turn, whether she wanted it or not. So I think she looked to the women who were the role models in her life. They were not women lawyers. There weren't any around. But in the orphanage, there were the grand doms of Jewish philanthropy who were assigned to the children to teach them about the finer things in life. And Bessie's big sister, as she was called, was an incredibly um, prosperous, or she was the wife of a very prosperous merchant in New Orleans and had access to the highest of society for a Jew in New Orleans. And I believe the kind of grace and poise, her carriage, the way she dressed, I believe was based on emulating those grand doms of philanthropy. Not flashy, she had a fine eye for fashion, as carefully edited as she would a brief. It gave her that dignity and the ability to capture attention of important people. The picture on the front of the book shows a couple things. One is she was not afraid to reveal leg (laughs) or wear heels. And this was at a time when Frances Perkins or perhaps the pinnacle of women's lawyering at the time, who was Judge Florence Allen, the first woman federal appeals court judge, I think people would identify their clothing and their style as rather frumpy. But Bessie Margolin decides, fine, I'm going to work with what I have. And it, she did it really, really well. Right. Bessie was going to play what she had, and that included her Southern accent, her diction. She liked to intrigue the justices and get them to want to ask questions. She was poised enough or able to act poised enough that she actually used humor in her arguments with the justices, something that is rare among the most prominent Supreme Court advocates. This is her arguing in front of the Supreme Court. Ooh. May I ask just this question? Do you stand or fall in this case on your answer to the Chief Justice? What do you mean, do I stand? As you I stand, say it, it you stand, I, I you stand, I stand, <laughs> I don't fall on either. <laughs> <laughs> This way of dealing with the justices, this is unheard of now. You don't make jokes yeah. in the Supreme Court. Cool. I love her. I feel like I would love to watch her in court. That would be something to see. She sounds like the kind of complex character that heavyweight actresses would clamor to play her. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You know, I, I've been laughing that I've noticed how often we keep saying, why isn't this a movie? But really, why isn't this a movie? Yeah. <laughs> this should be a movie. Someone make a movie of this. We should probably start screenwriting on the side. Before this episode there's we need to get life right. right.
It did not make her immune from criticism by any means. I talk about in the book how especially Justice Frankfurter, and I'm sure there were others, it's just Justice Frankfurter had a penchant for writing down what occurred to him on notes and passing them to law clerks. And he made a couple notes that ended up in Harvard Law School's library that Bessie was quite adept at using her feminine charms. Which seems to have not been a compliment from him. Uh huh. <laughs> I think that he maybe wasn't a big fan of the way that she was able to go head to head with him. Mm. So she was certainly not immune. And I think a lot of what makes her life so interesting is our second guessing whether we would have made the same choices she did and really trying to understand, you know, how could she? Why did she? Especially when it came to some of her choices about her social life and her personal life and her intimate life, which I think leave still to this day a little bit of head scratching, but it really adds to the complexity of this of this persona. One of the things that Marlene Tressman says about how interesting this is that this extremely fashion forward woman would spend her life representing working class people. Yeah. You know, she's representing the meat packers union or workers in battery plants. People who are working in the most degraded, most unsafe workplaces. People that perhaps even the judges would look down on. Yeah. That her appearance, her absolute put togetherness at all times gives dignity to those workers, to that argument that that this woman is the one representing a class of people who maybe people would assume she is far above. So there was this wonderful dignity that she was bringing to the cases on behalf of people Mm. whose jobs were the messiest, were the dirtiest, and who I think she was also bestowing this dignity of work and an ethic, I think, that goes back to her days in the Jewish orphaned, where she was with children who could have been the children of similar workers who had died. I think it gave her a real sensitivity for the people on whose back major industry was reaping the benefits. Oh, wow. Cool. This is where my question from the beginning of the episode comes in. I think it's very interesting to think about why she ends up in this job. Yes, this was a good place for a woman lawyer to work, but I think there are some really interesting ties there to her childhood. Ah, She would have been growing up with children whose parents were working class and maybe You know, she's seen firsthand the results of unregulated greed on the lives of human beings. Hmm. In one particularly poignant address given during Bessie's time, and all of the children were in attendance at these grand anniversary events, a prominent rabbi from New Orleans spoke about how the crowd should be pleased at how they had helped the lives of the children seated in the audience, but that they should also make sure that when these children went out into the world, that they would face conditions in industry and in labor that were appropriate, and that Bessie should have gone on from there to be one of the people to fight for those kinds of conditions, fair conditions in in working. So there is something quite beautiful, I think, about the way she presented the cases and how important they were to her. So she never married, but it's clear that she had an extremely active love life. And being this brilliant woman, most of her partners were her intellectual and social equals, which means they were in her workplace. Wow. So the people with whom she had affairs were her intellectual equals, and they were married, relieving her of any potential obligation for traditional marriage. 
The problem is, there's a couple things. One is, wouldn't you just be setting yourself up to say you didn't earn the promotion, you didn't earn the job? I think that she must have thrown that caution to the wind because I can't imagine that that wouldn't have (laughs) been a concern. Wow, she's a thoroughly modern woman. She absolutely is. Wow. She was engaged in college, and this man that she was engaged to gave her a book of poetry. And all through the margins of this book of love poetry, she wrote in lines from Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. Wow. And this is just a few months after A Room of One's Own is published in America. So she's one of the very first people to be reading this. Mm. And she apparently loved it enough to be taking notes, but writing them in the margins of this book of poetry from her fiancé, I think... Wow, intriguing. I think it speaks really clearly to her understanding of the choice she has to make. That if she wants this career, if she wants to be able to make choices about her life and pursue the things that are important to her, she is not going to be able to be married. So the other Jewish orphan girl in this story is Marlene Tressman. Wow. I was wondering, when is the second orphan girl going to come into this story? (laughs) Oh, wow. Marlene Tressman grew up in the exact same Jewish child care system that Bessie Margolin was raised in. Wow. Although the orphanage that she grew up in had closed in 1946, my parents had both died by the time I was 11 in the late 60s. It had transformed to a non-residential social service agency for the same Jewish children in those seven southern states. And it became my legal guardian and oversaw my foster care after my parents died in the 60s. My Jewish orphanage made me a candidate for a provision that the school retained in its charter after it was spun off as independent from the orphanage. And that is, any Jewish orphan would not be denied admission for lack of tuition, assuming they passed all the entrance exams. In fact, she says she is probably the only modern-day Jewish orphan to attend the Isidore Newman School under the auspices of this first agreement. And this school now is still a ticket to the very best universities in the country. Wow. And I was lucky to get a great scholarship to attend Goucher College in Baltimore. And the high school guidance counselor at Newman said, I'd like to introduce you by letter to Miss Bessie Margolin. She was an alumna of our class of 1925, and you and she have a lot in common. So I go to Goucher, it's 1974, I get up my courage, I know I'm supposed to call this woman who's a legend for some reason, that she's a big deal, and I use the dorm phone, call her, she was clearly expecting my call. And she invited me to visit her, knowing I had to take the train or the bus, invited me to spend the weekend with her at her apartment. Um, She was then either in Arlington or DC and took me to the Kennedy Center and out to dinner at a fancy French restaurant and began what would be about a 12-year friendship between me and this amazing, audacious woman. Here is this perfect model for her that exactly matches her life. Mm -hmm. And she has modeled how to succeed, you know, in a life that a Jewish orphan girl from New Orleans might not know they could aspire to. Right, yeah. That, to me, characterizes wasn't truly a mentor-mentee relationship, although she did open doors to introduce me to important people at the Labor Department and others when I attended law school and was always there to help me. She even ended up writing my recommendations for admission to the D.C. and Maryland Bar 
Bessie Margolin loaned her a stack of her Supreme Court briefs to use in one of her legal writing courses. Uh, but she jokes they were so above her head that they were absolutely no use to her. <laughs> <laughs> wow. When she died, I was astonished that no one had ever written about this woman. So I started to submit her name to different organizations that I thought should write about her or put her in some hall of fame. And the responses were all very positive. That is, yes, we'd love to know all about this woman, but you'll have to write it. I am a practicing lawyer. At that time, I had two small children. My workload was crazy. And writing a biography was, I didn't have a degree in that. But I realized no one else was going to do it. And by 2005, especially after public speaking for different organizations, including the one she and I were most beholden to, whether Newman School or the the successor to the Jewish orphanage, I would talk about how important she was. So by 2005, I committed myself to writing something, and it took until 2016 for the book to come out. Which is excellent, by the way. It's so well written, and the connections between Bessie Margolin and Marlene Trussman are really fascinating, yeah. and I think add a whole nother layer to this. Cool. My goal has been both to do her justice and to make sure that history remembers her. And I'm so pleased that her name is included in important places. When I'm asked to speak, I channel her and wonder how she would have felt about certain things. I was particularly pleased to have been able to give a talk about her at Yale Law School. You know, there are certain places that if I could guess what her response would be, that, the Library of Congress, the FDR Library, those give me great joy to have her name be spoken about and recalled in these important places. You know, in this podcast, we've talked a lot about how important it is to have a champion who keeps your story alive. Yeah. Another thing that I always think we do not give enough credit to is how important it is to have a model. You know, there's the phrase, you can't be what you can't see. But I think we really don't understand how true and how important that is. You can't conceive of entire career paths unless you see someone like you doing them. I think... That is connected to my, I can't remember, was it my second reason why I love teaching history? Because Hmm. it's storytelling and how you tell the story matters. And I think it's at the core of what we are as humans to hear stories and absorb them and become them. So having a model is to me, kind of another way of just saying having a story. Yeah, exactly. I think probably everybody, their life is driven by the stories that they absorbed. Some stories just bounce right off us and don't make a difference. But sometimes we'll encounter a story that opens up a path to us. Yeah. So speaking of stories, my favorite story for my interview with Marlene Trussman is this one. When Marlene Trussman finished her biography of Bessie Marklin, she arranged to have a copy of her book sent to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, thinking that she might enjoy it, you know, women's legal history. Because I won an award from the Supreme Court Historical Society, one of the editors of their journal was kind enough to take a book I inscribed for Ruth Bader Ginsburg and make sure it got to her. If you just write to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it's in bags and bags of mail. She is so hot, it never gets seen. And she received a handwritten note back from Ruth Bader Ginsburg thanking her for writing the book. It's a card, handwritten, which I hear she rarely does, from the Chambers of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. As daunting as the undertaking must have been, You have accomplished an important mission in bringing the work and days of a remarkable woman vividly to light. Although Bessie's path and mine never crossed, I had heard much about her. 
thank you for enabling me and legions of other lawyers to appreciate what a front runner she was. Cheers, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's just so precious to me. Oh, that's cool. So we have a picture of this note that she has framed. Oh, and, cool. And has on her wall. So we have a picture of this note on our website. Wonderful. So the day that Marlene Trestman, you have to be admitted to the Supreme Court. You have to like apply and be admitted to be able to argue or even to represent someone huh. in a Supreme Court argument. And the day that she was admitted to the Supreme Court was the first day that Ruth Bader Ginsburg sat on the court. Ha! Cool. And so she says, even though those two were never in the room together. I have to believe there would have been great affinity. I do think this legacy of powerful women in the American legal system is something we don't talk enough about. That because there have been so few women on the Supreme Court or in the upper echelons of governmental power, we forget how much power Mm -hmm. women have wielded that defending these landmark legislations is as important as getting them passed. You know, the other message of Bessie, which makes your podcast so attractive, is how many women's stories were never told in the first place or have been forgotten. And that's just so important to make sure that these voices get heard and that we listen. If you'd like to learn more about Bessie Margolin, we have pictures, links to Marlene Trustman's biography, and her newest project on the New Orleans Jewish Orphanage at our website at whatshernamepodcast.com. Music for this episode was provided by the New Hot Five, Jeff Kuno, Peak Duo, Faye Nippon, Ivano Battistone, and David Bellucci. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would take a minute to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, it makes a huge difference in our ability to reach new listeners and bring you more women making history. This episode was edited by Olivia Mickle and What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson.